evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, now, you know what? Somebody told me that this is a meeting that's being held of the historic designation, people that are interested in historic buildings in the city of Detroit. So I'm going to try that again, and I would like to hear a real historic, resounding welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, I messed you up with that one, didn't I? I took you back too far in history and said, okay, the afternoon was back then. Let's come to the evening. Let's try it one more time. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Now, there you go. Now, I know you were expecting to see your Detroit City Council President, Brenda Jones, and I apologize for that. I am her chief of staff, Stephen Grady. She was not able to attend the meeting, but she did want me to come to give you a few words to let you know why we're here tonight. Now, the purpose of this event is to learn about how to designate a historic district for those who may have a historic building, how to make specific repairs to that, the building permit process, and then also some affordable solutions to property rehab. Now, I read that to mean, how can I get some help to restore my building since there are certain standards that I must meet since I have a historic building. And I know there are some of you here in the audience who may not necessarily own a historic building, but you have one in your community. Or you may just be a person that um, reminisces on the history of Detroit and sees certain buildings that you would like to see preserved. So for whatever reason you're out here tonight, I want to thank you so much for coming. We appreciate your attendance, and we're going to try to do everything that we can do to answer your question. Now, this is what I'm going to tell you what the council president always says. At a certain point, we're going to open up the floor for any questions that you might have. Now, note, I did say questions, not comments, right? Questions. Now, if you have a question in your mind, you say, oh, I better not ask that. You know what you just did? You just committed the first cardinal rule of a council president, Brenda Jones, town hall, is that if you have a question, please ask it. Because the only question that's a bad question is what? The one that's not asked. So you might have a question that my answer, someone on this side of the room may have a question that answers the concern that someone on this side of the room has. So we're gonna have a dialogue and we've got a panel of experts here. And I wanna thank Eric Kehoe of the Preservation Detroit organization. Yeah, you can give Eric a round of applause. I don't know, Eric, that was a little weak. I think you're going to have to let them know, you know, what you do and, and how you can help <laughs> folks that have the interest in, in the historical uh, buildings of Detroit. All right. But it's a, it's a partnership, folks. Of, why are you laughing? It's a partnership of Preservation Detroit and the city of Detroit to bring all of these resources, to bring all of these experts at your fingertips to answer your questions, to help you, and to give you the support that you need so that we all can achieve the vision that we have of Detroit, having new beautiful buildings and beautiful neighborhoods, but also preserving those buildings that we all remember from childhood or for those of us who have just come to Detroit and appreciate the architecture of the city, acknowledging that as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric, and we're going to give Eric another round of applause. <laughs> let's, let's let him know that we like him being here. There we go. Thank you so much. All yeah, right. that's All what right. I'm talking about. Thank you so much. For sure. So uh, show of hands, how many folks here live in a Detroit historic district? All right. Well, let, let's, uh, let's hear some of the districts. So where is everybody from? Just go ahead and shout out your neighborhood. Russell Woods, Boston Edison, Rosedale Park, New Center, West Virginia or Virginia Park, Bagley, all right, Arden Park, Sherwood Forest, North End, all right, we're representing tonight. It's good. So, uh, okay, how about uh, 
are any folks here considering moving to a historic district or move or buying a home? Okay, good, good. And uh, here's a, kind of a tricky question. How many folks here know that University District, North Rosedale Park, and Palmer Woods are not Detroit historic districts? Oh, we're gonna learn about that tonight. We're gonna learn about that tonight. We have a lot of historic, a lot of historic buildings, but not all of them are in Detroit historic districts. So, uh, just a little bit about Preservation Detroit. My name is Eric Kehoe. I'm the president of the board of directors. Uh, we started as a student group at Wayne State in 1975 to save historic buildings on campus, and we have called uh, the McKenzie House our home for around 40 years. That's the home of Wayne State's founder in Midtown. Uh, we host more than 100 tours throughout the year. We do preservation advocacy to protect historic and older buildings in the city. And we help put on events like this in order to educate the general public on what preservation looks like in Detroit. So we're currently, a couple of things that we got going on, we're advocating for the protection of a historic block of buildings near the new arena. Uh, these, bu these buildings are the kind of thing that we want to keep up. They help create this walkable, dense neighborhood. They're good buildings, right? Um, and they're one of the few types of these buildings, the block together that we have left, so they're really important. We're also working with Dr. Chapman and the Historic Designation Advisory Board to conduct a survey of Midtown. And in Midtown, we're gonna take a look at all the buildings there, see what kind of historic buildings we have, and uh, hope to go forward with that, right? So. In Detroit, preservation and using our old buildings, that's an asset. Our old buildings are an asset in the city. And you all, for being here, whether you know it or not, you all are preservationists. By owning a historic home, by making those repairs throughout the day, you're helping steward our history and keep, keep that alive in the city. It's, you're really important to, the, to, to what goes on. So one of the things I, another thing, another asset to the movement of preservation in Detroit is that it's multiracial, it's multi-generational, right? There's men and women involved, and we really have a strong historic preservation movement in the city. It's awesome. And people look to Detroit and comment on Detroit for the, the stuff that's going on here. So I think we should give yourselves a round of applause for all the work that you're doing in your neighborhoods. And let's, let's give one more round of applause to Council President Brenda Jones and her office for all the work they've been doing. So I think with that, um, let's get started. So we're going to have a couple of presentations, and then uh, toward the end we'll have time for Q&A and some, uh, some work with that. And yeah, first up is... Um, Eric. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. Sorry. Okay. Hey, yeah, just please. before we get started, mm -hmm. could we just have all of the panelists just give their name and maybe their title, just so folks can get a sense of who's in the room? It's a good idea. Oh, he wants you to stand up. Stand up. How's everybody doing? My name is Kimani Jeffrey. I'm with the City Planning Commission. Uh, that is, that's a, a department under the City Council. Um, and I'll give a little bit more information once we get into the presentation, but my role with the city is as, 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 as a city, city planner. Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Janice Chapman. I am the Senior Historic Preservation Planner with the City of Detroit's Historic Designation Advisory Board. Um, I see some familiar faces in the, in the room. We are the um, designation portion of this process. I. Um, and, and part of the Detroit, history, um, Detroit City Council and part of the city's legislative policy division. Hi. Okay. I'm Jennifer Ross. I'm with the Detroit Historic District Commission. I serve as staff for the commission. Um, I also work for the Planning and Development Department. We're under the mayor's side. Um, and I'm excited to be here, resident of Detroit, just recently within the last year. Um, so I'm here and we'll talk a little bit more about our side of the process once we get underway with the presentations. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Reinhardt. I'm a preservation specialist based in, De oh, 
Preservation Specialist based in Detroit for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We're a statewide nonprofit education advocacy organization, and I also live in a historic district. I live in Lafayette Park, so I'm excited to be here and wear double hats. Good evening, everyone. My name is James Foster. I'm the manager of the Building Safety Engineering Environmental Department. We permit every single development project in the city of Detroit, new rehab. So um, I'm proud to be working for you, and that's why we're here, is because we want to be able to assist you in anything that it is that you foresee happening with yourselves and your properties in the future. Thank you very much. So I think uh, to get started, uh, let's have Dr. Chapman from HDAB. Oh, and just as, just as um, Dr. Chapman is getting started, just to let you know that this event is being tape recorded and will be rebroadcast on channel 10. So if we ask you to go to a microphone when you have a question, or if the panelists need to go to a microphone, please know that you all are our studio audience, but there's going to be another viewing audience at a later date who will be able to see this. And you're going to be on television yourself. Is that OK with everyone? <laughs> I wasn't going to ask that last part, <laughs> but I try to be nice, you know. <laughs> can everyone Can everyone hear me? Can everyone hear me? I am holding right in my mouth. Okay, <laughs> great. Okay, um again, my name is Janice Chapman and I'm with the City Historic Designation Advisory Board and we are the arm that does the designation. In most cities, it's just one department and they do both the designation and the enforcement or regulatory aspect of historic designation. In the city of Detroit, there are two separate departments, the Historic Designation Advisory Board, of which I am um, a, a staff of, and then the Historic District Commission, and Jennifer will be speaking to that a little bit later. Um, I like to say that I am the one that does the, we do the history and we write the ordinance that um, enforces those local um, things that you can and cannot do in your um, in your neighborhood. So Jennifer has the great thrill of enforcing that after we pass it on to her. So I like to tell people that we're the people who do the pretty pictures and do the history and, and go out into the community and deal with it from that perspective. Um, I'm going to go fairly quickly because I think most of the time needs to be spent as, after seeing a show of hands of a question, or Jennifer explaining what HDC does, what they can do, uh, and what those things in, in, entail. So I'm gonna go fairly quickly, but I wanted to tell you and give a little background as how we got here. I think more often than not, are there, let me say a show of hands on how many people have moved into historic districts within the last five, seven years. So do you know, a lot of these people did not receive a letter saying welcome to, you're now living in a historic district. And I think that's what we want to talk a little bit about. So I'm just going to let you know how do we get here, show you some historic districts, and then I'm going to turn it over to our next presenter, which is Jennifer Ross. Um, next. Again, this is just, I wanted to welcome and, and, and identify who I am. Next. Next. Okay, the historic designation, and I, I go very fast. If I'm talking too fast, someone's put their hands up because I am a fast talker. Um, the Historic Designation Advisory Board, our ordinance is under Chapter 25, Article 2 of the 1984 Detroit City Code Ordinance, which established historic districts here in the city of Detroit. Uh, what is interesting, as I pointed out, is that the Historic Designation Advisory Board staff prepares historic designation study reports like the ordinance, and the Historic District Commission, under the executive branch, enforces historic districts regulatory. So we're with the legislative body, and they're with the mayor um, and the executive body. Next. Our mission statement is to advise city councils on matters relating to historic preservation, and in particular, proposals for designation of local historic districts. Our staff is able to provide citizens with assistance in all kinds of areas and questions pertaining 
to um, issues of preservation, as well as kind of pointing the direction of resources and to communities pertaining to historic um, matters. What's interesting, and I like to point out, is that our office, when we when we talk about our mission statement, it has gotten right. We're the ones who come out and do a lot of the commercial uh, excuse me, community uh, meetings prior to the designation. If someone or someone anyone can request local designation, and I want to make that very clear. Anyone who's a citizen of the city of Detroit can request local designation. You don't have to live in that neighborhood. You don't have to um, live in the if there's a building in downtown Detroit. If there's a church, if there is a synagogue, it doesn't matter. If there's a park, anyone can um, request local designation. Everything in the city of Detroit is considered a district, so it can be a single building or it's multi buildings. So. I think it's referred to in the city of Detroit as a district. So if you hear that, don't think that it has to be more than one building or one than, more than one resource. Next. The Historic Designation Advisory Board composes or comprises of nine members. They are appointed by the city council. Um, we try to get one from each of the council districts, and then there's two at-large council members. But let me be very clear. Unlike other boards, our board, you don't have to live in a historic district to be appointed to the board. We don't have to just appoint someone to from um, every district, but we like to. Our board also, we make sure that there is an architect, an architect preservationist on our board who can address uh, um, those concerns, a historian. So those are the things that we look for, as well as people who live in a historic district or in the neighborhood or who may just be interested in history. Because that is, we have a couple of professors on our board, so it comprises of all types of people who are interested in the, preser the preservation of um, Detroit's history. We have two ex-officio ex members. These are non-voting members. One is from the Planning Commission, of which we are now part of that department, and the other is a representative from the Planning and Development Department. Jennifer um, usually comes to those meetings and sits in, and works in that capacity. Um, usually that comes from their director who will send somebody to our meeting. We have right here has three professional staff members that kind of chuckle. Um, sort of true. We have two part-time <laughs> staff members and one full-time member. So I guess we had three professional <laughs> staff members. Depends on the day. Next. But that's changing. Um, when you talk about local designation and, and you know, everybody says, well, am I on the National Register or local designation? I think um, Grady spoke, Mr. Jones spoke to, uh, Grady spoke to that earlier when he said how many people or was that, um, Oh, excuse me. That was Eric who asked that question. How many, you know, how many people didn't realize that Palmer Woods is not a locally designated district? It is on the National Register of Historic Places. It is not locally designated. So you can be locally designated and not be on the and not be on the National Register, or you can be on the National Register and not be locally designated. Usually, we um, you usually are both, but in some cases, you could be one and or the other and the boundaries may change or be different. National Register districts basically deal only with the thumbprints of those districts, so it is the building or the parcel in which they sit on or that lot lines. Our designation takes you to the center lines of streets and alleys. Um, so that's, the, that's another difference. And a lot of times people ask why. Local ordinance built a buffer around each of our districts, and we've done that so that they're to kind of negate the adverse impact that uh, it may have on our historic properties. Next. What are the criteria for evaluation of historic districts? Next. We have both hist history and architectural significance. Those are our two criteria. Dealing with uh, issues of use, we don't regulate use. That's not what we do in our office. That's not our charge. Um, it's only historical and architectural significance. So I want people to understand that because a lot of times people will bring up all these other issues and that is not our, that's not our charge. Und by law, these are the two things that we have to look at. So when we're look doing a designation, those are the two criteria that we focus in on. Next. Just a little, um, I want to give you a little background, a little facts. And some of these numbers have changed, so I will um, give you an update on that. It says here that Detroit has a... 40 designated historic districts. That has in um, now we have 161. We have four. Excuse me, five historic historic districts that are pending, so they're under study at this present time. So that number will increase probably by the, by July or by the end of summer. Um, I keep losing our 
I know. Um, uh, and within there, we have both um, our largest district, which is Rosedale Park, and I know we have representatives here from Rosedale Park. Can I just show our hands again? I recognize some faces there. So yeah, there are large, and um, our small uh, Russell Woods is our next largest. Boston Edison used to be the largest historic district, but they have been surpassed by two others. And the remaining districts have, um, we said we have over 2,200, probably at this point closer to 3,000 uh, 3, homes that are designated. Detroit's largest um, this commercial district is the financial district in downtown Detroit, um, 36 buildings. We have Capitol Park, um, and the keeps moving, but we'll keep going. Uh, and um, as well as the lower Woodward Quarter, which has 34 commercial buildings. Use this new center, and I know that's all I show of somebody of hands of someone who spoke about living in the Virginia Park new center area. So that district is is part of our mixed use district. And these are areas that are located next to are located in what is town historically have been known as the cast or the corridor. Um, Detroit largest apartments are Palmer Park, not too far from here. The Palmer Park apartments they are on the local and national register. And it's um, great apartment buildings. I lived in three apartment buildings in that area, in that in that neighborhood. As I was making my way through school and working summers, rents used to be really cheap. I don't know if that's the case anymore. Struggling student. Um, so, and then we have over 20. It has 23 religious structures. That has increased now close to 30. Next. And I like to thank you. I like to show this. Um, that's better. These next. These next two slides, and to, again, to say, why is it important? And when you look at this particular slide, you see a wedding. Why is it important? Now you see the note vision, but that's okay. <laughs> it makes my point even more. Um, but you saw people standing, basically, in a, you know, the uh, wedding party standing there. And, you know, and, and basically, you see the church in the small corner there. So I always say to people, will your children ask you where you got married? What will you say? Over there by the unleaded? Because that's a gas station. So we demolished that beautiful building, that beautiful structure, to make way for a gas station. And so you took your pictures, yes, you know, this, this couple may have, but that memory is gone because there is no sense of place. Next. And I like this, like you say, come again or tell them again. You tell them one time, but my mother always taught me, you got to tell them twice. So what is this? This is a... And you got kids standing there with their little school picture. They're all excited and happy to be there. There's the historic school sitting there. And we know about historic schools being vacant and abandoned here in the city of Detroit, correct? Yes. Many of them are in our neighborhoods. We're working on that. We're working closely, again, with um, Jennifer in, in her office to identify and try to protect as many of those as possible. But no one's going to look back finally on the time when they spent their time in a parking garage. You know, your class picture, you bring your kids and say, let me show you where I went to school. And it used to be right there by that parking garage. That's why we do this. Next. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm going to go very quickly through these. These are just some historic districts in the city of Detroit. Grand Circus Park. Next. Um, we talked about the financial district having 36 commercial buildings. Next. Boston Edison, as I pointed out, we did have someone here from Boston Edison, a couple of people, um, both on the National Register uh, and, the, and the Federal Register of Historic Places next. Palmer Park Apartments, just beautiful apartment buildings. They still, you know, with some love, and I always say it just takes a little love. You can see that this neighborhood is still pretty intact. Next. Okay. And we'll keep going. <laughs> West Canfield, I don't know if people are familiar with the West Canfield Historic District. It's one of our early ones over there by um, traffic jams or TJs, as we used to call it back in the day. Um, next, this is um, West Village. Um, um, keep going, just running through. Indian Village, the Woodbridge neighborhood, Sherwood Forest. We lost Sherwood Forest. I wanted to kind of stop there at Sherwood Forest. Sherwood Forest, because it is very close to this to, to their meeting spot, and Sherwood Forest is an example of a community that when they require came to us for a local designation, it was a, a, 
you just meeting the, the, the community folks and coming out to the community meetings, you just knew that they, you know, they knew this was a special place and it was important for them to protect that. Next. I know. Um, Lafayette Park. I get a garden. Keep going because we're losing. Fort Shelby. So we don't just designate large historic um, buildings and large districts. I wanted to show you what else we designate, and I think if you kind of keep going. Um, places like this, not too far from here, Baker's Keyboard Lounge. How many people are familiar with that? Quite a few. It's the oldest place, and I always like to say that. Everybody always say, well, you know, I, we fight with the New Yorkers because we'll say we're the oldest place in which jazz has continually been played, and that's the truth. Now, we may not be the oldest jazz club, as they keep telling us. I said, but you guys stop playing at your original jazz clubs. We never stopped. So we, can, we have that claim to fame, um, which is very important. Um, and if we can't get to it, I'm going to sum up, because it looks like the, I'll see how, what happens here right quick. Well, basically, because I'm going to go ahead and, 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 and move forward, because I think that, as I pointed out, I, I think that um, I'm going to turn this over to Jennifer very quickly. But basically, what I wanted to say is that we don't always just designate houses and buildings and properties that look like this. We also designate ordinary houses, such as the United Sound Systems recording studio, which we just lost um, on visually, which is basically two, as, as you can see here, this is basically just two, um, two houses, or one house in particular, that was uh, purchased and started a music studio. And all the pictures of the people that you just saw in that, in that um, montage is people who have recorded at the United Sound System um, from Otis Reddy. I mean, you just kind of, uh, can I? <laughs> Dramatics, <laughs> George Clinton. Yes, yeah, you can see, Hot Butter Soul himself, Isaac Hayes. So everybody, but what's interesting is also, and a lot of people are not aware, and we like when we do tours, particularly with young people, we tell them, um, this is where Barry Gordy first got his start. Mm -hmm. He learned this, the music industry from the folks at the United Sound System yes. out of that house that is located right there at the corner of 2nd and St. Antoine. Next, I, I'm hoping we can get through this. Motown. We are in the midst of studying, not just looking at the Motown um, and the history of Motown, which people are familiar with, but what's interesting about that portion of the, of the West Grand Boulevard, we're calling that the West Grand Boulevard Arts and Business, African American Arts and Business District, because in many cases, this neighborhood had a very, as I call it, the FUBU effect, for us, by us. Mm -hmm. You had a situation where black, Entrepreneurs started their businesses. They could buy homes and start their business out of these houses. They lived maybe on the second floor, but businesses were started and, and originated here at these buildings. So it's going to keep doing that? Okay, so we found out it's going to keep doing that. So, just, <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna keep going. Uh, okay, so we're, well, basically, I'm going to go ahead and finish up quickly, if we can. Um, I wanted to show a couple of, uh, one in particular, one house, but not only do we designate houses, and as you can see, the Motown houses, they, two, two, they're basically just regular houses that they turn into the Motown sound, um, but its history and its legacy is international. So why do we do, that, do this? This is in part why we do this. Not only to protect and to preserve, but to share that history to uh, for future generations. I always tell people we are stewards of this, these properties. You know, we own them, but yes, but we're also stewards of this property. And it's important that we have a legacy to move and pass on to, our, to the next generation. Um, because this is, can we get to the next one? Or is that not gonna work? Okay, Dr. Osan Sweet's house. Okay, why don't we take it off of the PowerPoint? Jennifer, if you want to go ahead and then get started. Or, to, or go to, James. we're going to go with James. And we're going to stop here. I am here. If there's any additional questions, um, 
we, during Q&A, please feel free to, um, to raise your hand. I will be walking around as we get to that portion of our, of today's, uh, or excuse me, this evening event. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Mr. Foster and let him, you have to use this mic, Mr. Foster. Yeah, that's what I was told. Uh, you have to stand up, sir. <laughs> Come around. No, no, sir. Uh, yes. You're welcome. Mr. Foster. <laughs> Good evening. I don't have a PowerPoint, so we'll be able to get through this uh, fairly quickly. So um, obviously you don't need um, a building permit for most renovations and rehabs. Most renovations and rehabs I find are DIYers that um, essentially when you're restoring a bathroom or a kitchen, that's not something that it absolutely will need a permit. However, when you start getting into things that you're going to be moving bearing walls and doing some structural uh, additions to your, your, whether it's commercial or residential, then you will need a building permit. You will be using the 2015 Rehabilitation Code. That's very important. If your structure was built prior to 1974, this is what you will be using, either you or your professional architect or contractor. If, in most cases, if you're going to be doing at least 50% of new construction or renovation to a existing home or commercial building that was constructed prior to 74, you're gonna be using that code. Anything else, you're gonna be using the most recent Michigan building code. We find that a lot of uh, new homes want to redo their entire plumbing systems want to do their entire electrical systems, yes, you will need to use the Michigan Building Code if you're going to be doing the entire system. If you're simply going to be patching, replacing certain things, then of course you will still stick with the renovation code. Understand, a lot of these things are difficult to interpret. I have a complete staff of architects, engineers, zoning inspectors, building inspectors that work for you that I'm proud to supervise. We are here to answer any of your questions. So before, if I don't see any of you again ever, I want you to remember that if you have any questions, and this is new, I've just set these uh, emails and phone numbers up. I want you to email me at drc at detroitmi.gov. That's drc at detroitmi.gov. That is our development resource center. So uh, remember that. Any, any questions you may have, any ideas, any dreams that you may have, if it has anything to do with renovating or restoring a property, if it has anything to do with any new development, if, you're, if some of you are ambitious and want to become developers. Um, uh, let me also say that we have a phone number, 224-2-DRC. 2242DRC. That's 372 for DRC. So please, I, I can't, I, you know, I can't express how important it is to me to hear and to address any of your concerns. All I've learned over the years that we've been doing this is I get takeaways from every one of our meetings as far as what it what the community wants, what they want to see, what they want to hear from the city of Detroit. That's why we've, we're in the midst of creating some very user-friendly, illustrated checklist to get you through the process. But in the meantime, so bear with us, in the meantime, please use that email and that phone number to communicate with me. So in, when you use the, the Michigan Building Code, I want you to focus on Chapter 3, which has three main methods of compliance. There are, you will be one of the three. 
And then I want you to focus on chapter 14, which is essentially applicability. And again, I don't want you to have to figure it out. Uh, if you get to a point, if you decide that you do not want to get to a point of using a professional, which I highly recommend because in the end, it will cost, it will save you monies. And it all depends on how far you're going to be going. And like I started this, I was saying most of you are going to be DIYers. And we're there to answer those questions for you. We've worked with some local groups who have created some very simple answers to those questions that you might have. So we're prepared for, for your, your questions. Um, and, you know, we're... We, it was, this, you know, Janice showed you a lot of historic buildings in the city of Detroit, schools, manufacturing, churches. I've been finding, and I'm very glad that this is happening, that we're adaptively reusing a lot of these structures these days. I mean, you know, uh, on, on Townsend Street on the east side, where there's going to be uh, 25 condos built, uh, our seller, Mitchell Taylor Banks, is reestablishing a, a manufacturing uh, facility on Mount Elliott. The, um, it, it, several other schools are being converted, elementary schools are being converted into industrial or innovative training centers in the communities. So we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of things happening with our vacant buildings. We're doing the best to not demolish them. The thing is that we would like to reestablish them, put them back in use, because we are trying to bring this community back together, and we're targeting areas that we can we think we can do that. We uh, have some smart people that know a lot more than I do, and what I do is simply permit these uh, these new developments. So again, my name is James Foster. Please, if you have any questions, any concerns, anything that crosses your mind, please send me an email or send me or give me a call. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you James. I'm not sure who I'm introducing next, Eric. Oh, yeah. Jennifer Reinhardt. Yeah. What well, the books are, are you, the books. Yes, the the book. I think the question was, how do you get those books? And those books are available at the uh, Construction Association of Michigan, and you can probably get them online rather than going to CAM is the short for that. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Again. I'll stand here. Um, my name is Jennifer Reinhardt. I'm a preservation specialist based in Detroit with the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Next. Um, can you even read that? Well, I'll, I'll help. Oh, well, <laughs> if it's not blinking in and out. Um, so we are the statewide nonprofit organization. Our main office is in Lansing, but we have field reps all over the state. So serving greater Michigan, southeast Michigan, and then I'm just in the city of Detroit because there is a lot happening in the city of Detroit involving historic resources. And um, our major mission, you know, we educate, we advocate for historic places, and that can take a lot of different forms. A lot of times it's helping people like yourselves who either want more information if you are engaging in DIY projects of, you know, methods or information, making sure that it's, um, a, you know, following the Secretary of Interior standards and is, um, you know, appropriate for being in a historic district. We also every year put out an annual directory because we are a membership organization. And so that features uh, craftsmen and tradespeople all throughout the state who are knowledgeable in working in historic properties. Um, next. So the type of education that we do, you may have attended some of our events in the past, and I do have some information in the back that I'll get to later of some upcoming events, but we really gear our workshops um, for homeowners, building managers, real estate professionals, and historic district commissions. Um, we do a wide variety of historic walking tours, uh, presentations of, you know, what it means, what different types of designations mean, um, 
the photo in the lower left is in the Jefferson Chalmers neighborhood, going through the history of the area. Um, we also do lots of hands-on and demonstration workshops on repairing, so on topics relevant to maintenance of older buildings. So how do you repair your wood windows? How do you weatherize your house and make it more energy efficient? How do you tackle pl old plaster issues in your building? What can you do f by yourself and what should you or could you um, call uh, professional tradespeople in? And then that photo is recent. That's our Living Trades Academy that we launched in the North End neighborhood. And that was a nine week job training program um, where it was intensive, 40 hours a week, um, and participants were trained um, by craftsmen um, on a lot of different topics. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that um, a lot got jobs upon completion last Friday. So we, but that's a big, um, a big part of our mission is there is a huge opportunity in Detroit to build up a local workforce and have, you know, create a job pipeline to do some of the rehab construction work, either in historic districts and a lot of the adaptive reuse buildings that um, are currently um, going on. Next. We also do research, um, so with our partners, National Trust for Historic Preservation, and then statewide, we have the Vacant Property Task Force and Sense of Place Council. I wanted to quickly highlight um, a study that we did that was funded by the Michigan State and Housing and Development Authority, where we actually looked at the property values, so data in local historic districts and then comparable neighborhoods with comparable homes that were not local historic districts, so pre-recession, through the recession, post-recession for about, what, 10 years, 10, 12 years. And our study showed that um, property values either stayed the same or increased in local historic districts. So that, you know, for all of you who have properties in, that's good to know. Um, next. Okay, another big part we do is advocacy. So Preservation Detroit is really the lead local advocacy partner but we support a lot of their efforts. And then through a lot of our conversations with neighborhood groups and with community members, when issues arise and we get phone calls, we do act upon that information. So I included a photo. Who's familiar with Vaughn's Bookstore? We are over here on the west side. Yeah. So Dexter. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a very significant building. Um, first African-American bookstore in the city. And um, currently there's a... National Park Service initiative that's studying African-American civil rights sites in the city of Detroit. And they were looking at this building. Um, it came to our attention that the building was on the demolition list. And so we were able to attend um, city council committee meeting, talk about the importance of the building. And through city council, um, rem we removed the building from the demolition list for the purposes of the study. So that's huge. Um, Thank you. Well, it wasn't. It was. It was a group effort. Um, and then at the federal level, every year um, we send a Michigan delegation to Washington D.C. to talk with congressmen about the importance of historic preservation. That became particularly relevant this previous year. It's all blending together. But with a lot of the tax cuts that were proposed and the federal historic tax credit was on the chopping block. And so we organized a postcard writing campaign with Preservation Detroit and some other local organizations and um, you know, ended up where we, um, the federal tax, well, one of them, the 20% was retained. Um, the 10% was eliminated, but we're focusing on the positive. And speaking of tax credits, if we could go to the next one, one of the big current advocacy issues at the statewide level is reinstating the state historic tax credit. For anyone, or it sounds like a lot of people in the room have been um, residents in historic districts for a while, so you may know that in 2011 we lost our state historic tax credit. It's one of the few, if not only, tools for homeowners in, you know, owner-occupied homes, these residential, oh no, we were doing so well. Um, <laughs> But it's for, it offers a 25% tax credit towards your total state income tax liability for rehabilitation expenses, um, which makes a difference. And it's, so we have a bipartisan statewide coalition. It's called My Impact. And we are currently, um, we've moved, so the bills have been introduced in Lansing. They've passed the Senate. They're in the House Tax Policy Committee. 
We just got informed that next Wednesday, it's going before a vote for before the committee in the House. Um, so we are hopeful that it will pass and then pass the House and then go to the governor. So it would really help if you could contact your statewide representatives and just say how what this would mean, um, that you are in favor of reinstating the credit and just emphasize that for Detroit, um, this would go a huge way towards helping maintain and uh, preserve our uh, quality historic building stock. And I did also want to mention that um, th should this, if and when this passes, um, it will be eligible f only for contributing buildings in local historic districts. So if you are in Palmer Woods, if you are in North Rosedale Park, if you are in you know, a non-local historic district, you will not be able to take advantage of this tax credit. Um, so more information can be found on our website. I'll have that information on the next slide or one of the next slides. Um, but I also wanted to mention we do have some upcoming events coming up that you are all invited to. I have flyers in the back. One is a series of practical preservation workshops. They will be taking place on the east side. Um, to, we're going to cover masonry repair and maintenance, weatherization and energy efficiency, and then a community planning session on proactive preservation, kind of concentrating on the work of the Chandler Park Housing Task Force. And then the other one is how to research the history of your home, um, going through some of the research uh, resources available. And then in August, we have, or we're planning for a vacant not blighted home tour that kind of spotlights the community histories of vacant buildings and also includes a home repair resource workshop to help address some of the financing and acquisition challenges um, in the city. So with that, and our website is www.mhpn.org. Um, oh, yes, slower. <laughs> www.mhpn.org. It's also on the... Um, the information in the back, and I'll be here, and we'll have a Q&A session. So, thank you. We're gonna change Jennifer's here. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see. So, let's see if we can get my presentation queued up. Yeah, yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, let me do that. So, hi, everybody. Um, once again, my name is Jennifer Ross, and I am staff with the Detroit Historic District Commission. Um, so I'm going to start really quickly to note that I feel like my role here tonight um, is to really present information on how this process, how the permitting process works within a local historic district. Um, I've been in this job since 2013. I've heard stories, numerous stories, um, issues, and really, you know, we hear a lot about the fact that folks find this process to be very opaque, uh, very opaque, um, kind of hard to understand, hard to go through. Um, so unlike my previous co colleagues or my colleagues with their previous presentation, I won't have a whole lot of really pretty pictures. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of text. But I feel like really I want to be here to provide as much information in the little tiny time frame that I have to educate folks. And then, of course, we'll talk more once we go through the question answer portion. Um, so if anybody has any issues with hearing me, because I tend to do a lot of that, um, <laughs> let me know. Just shout, give me a shout out. Okay. So just really quickly, what are the benefits of being in a, histor in a local historic district? Um, so, of course, having the designation, um, having those rules, um, although oftentimes they seem tough, um, and we get a lot of questions, why do I have to follow these rules? And it's like, well, just note, the same rules that we're holding you to, we're holding your neighbors to. So having that designation protects the character, protects the appearance of your neighborhood. So also noting with over 11,000 designated properties, Historic districts are a special interest group. You have a voice. The more people that get together in these types of meetings, the more people that get together that attend eight staff meetings, attend Preservation Detroit and Michigan Historic Preservation Network um, events, the more you get your, your voice out there, our 
elected officials know that, that your districts are important to you. Also, um, being in a district requires contractors to pull permits. I tell everybody all the time, this helps protect the homeowner. Um, if you follow our process, um, the building department ensures that the work is inspected and is done according to the code, is done according to um, standards which the building department enforces through their inspection unit. Um, and really, you, you never want to get in a position where you have a contractor and your contractor is asking you as a homeowner to pull that permit because guess what happens? If the work is done incorrectly, the building department comes out to inspect, it's on the homeowner. Um, so I'm always, I'm very, very vocal about make sure that you have a contractor who is licensed and who pulls permits. Um, also noting that staff is available to assist with the permitting process. Um, so currently we have two staff people at the Historic District Commission, it's myself and my colleague Audra Dye. And I'm happy to announce that we have one position that's posted. So we're, gonna, we're looking at getting a third person. Um, and that's all driven by the fact that there's so much activity, so much work going on within our local districts. The mayor heard that, we're getting a third person and we're all really excited about that so we can provide better service to our residents and our districts. And finally, um, just touching upon what Jennifer Reinhardt uh, just talked about, which is that potential for that state historic preservation tax credit. So 25%. Um, it's going to be a huge game changer. I want to be able to tell people when I'm saying you must do this, I want to be able to tell them, and if you do, you will get a 25% <laughs> tax credit on the um, value of that work that you're doing. Um, so just a couple of, of additional benefits that are really outside of our ordinance that the commission doesn't really have or doesn't have purview over, but being in a historic district provides to residents. Um, so number one, uh, staff could work with the building department and the Department of Neighborhoods to assist in issues that we hear crop up t from time to time. Um, for instance, property and maintenance blight issues. Um, oftentimes when folks see issues of property maintenance in their neighborhood and they're not even sure who to call, who to call in the, in the building department, they'll contact us. We work really closely with James and our colleagues in the building department to be able to plug in the right person uh, with that issue so that those issues can be addressed. Um, we also have the ability to recommend a zoning clearance check. And what that is is it's part of the due diligence. If you are about to buy a home in a historic district or buy a home in general within the city of Detroit, contact the building department, see if there are any existing violations on that home so that you know before you get into or while you're getting into the negotiation period, you could say, wait a minute, I know that these existing violations are standing. Those will need to get dressed, addressed upon my purchase and occupation of this building. Um, let's talk about the price. <laughs> and just general code enforcement issues. Um, so we get a lot of phone calls about use. Um, as Ms. Chapman noted, um, the Historic District Commission ordinance has no purview over use. We don't address use. However, we get a lot of phone calls from folks in our districts talking about illegal uses like Airbnbs, um, residents' homes. And once again, we're here as staff to connect um, our residents to the correct person to talk to in the building department to start addressing some of those issues. Um, so this is just a little kind of bar graph to once again highlight what Ms. Reinhardt touched upon. Once again, one of the benefits of living in a historic district, this was a, this was based on research that was done last year. So this is actually Detroit specific and it's really touching upon the fact that within um, local historic districts. And as Dr. Chapman noted, um, so you, you see the bar for local historic district, the average value of homes being 39,000. Within Na National Register historic districts, the average value of homes almost being 50,000. And as Dr. Chapman noted, a lot of our National Register districts also happen to be locally designated districts. So there's that crossover. But then outside of districts, um, both national register and local, you see that 
property value dropped to 19,000. So we're seeing through the work that um, preservation, I'm sorry, Michigan Historic Preservation Network has done that living properties within historic districts, people tend to take better care of them because of our rules. People tend to migrate into those neighborhoods when they move to Detroit because they tend to be the, the most beautiful neighborhoods with the best architecture and the most well-kept properties. And so this, the value really reflects those characters. So getting into the process. Um, so just a general rule of thumb, I tell everybody, um, no exterior work can begin in a local historic district with designated district without a permit. Um, so the permit triggers or the permit requires HTC sign off. So while, while you're going down to the building department, let's say you don't know you're in a local historic district. If you're working with a reputable contractor, they will go to the building department to pull the, par the permit and at that time the building department, if they're not aware that they're in a district, will signal to them, you're in a district, you need to start the process with historic. The permit won't be issued until the work is approved by the historic district commission, either at a staff level or at the commission level. You'll take that letter of approval and then go downstairs to the building department and pull your permit. Um, and so just noting again, sign off is provided by the commission or staff depending upon the nature of the work. And so we'll get into to that. Um, so what is the definition of exterior work? Once again, it's any work within the boundaries of a local historic district to include the existing building envelope. If you're painting, if you're doing signage, if you're doing landscaping, you want to take down a tree. If you're doing a new sidewalk, driveway, light poles, et cetera. So any, any exterior work proposal within the boundaries of the district must be reviewed at some level. Um, Noting once again, or not once again, but noting that all four sides of the building, um, and the, so the front, the back yards, the front, back, side elevations, they're all reviewed and weighted equally. Um, oftentimes we get a question, you know, well, if we, if we do the work faithfully in the front or the sides, can we kind of put in some vinyl windows in the rear? No, I mean, <laughs> no. It's kind of like that scope creep, the vinyl creep of once it happens in the back and then it slowly creeps around to the front. So we look at each four side as equally important. And we also look at new construction within district boundaries. We review that um, and that's primarily to ensure that the quality and the type of the architecture that's being built really stands up to the quality of the homes and the buildings within the local historic districts. Um, so we have a few items, a number of items, and if, if you guys, if y'all have had the opportunity to pick up my little informational brochure, it lists those items that can be undertaken within a district without even HTC review. And so those are items that we term or we look at as, as minor, like maintenance, yearly maintenance. Um, so that includes painting the same colors at the same location, and I won't go through all of them. but. If you can kind of see kind of the repetition in the text, and it's a few. So if it's repairing a few shingles um, or replacing a few panes of glass with matching glass, um, tuck pointing small areas, then that's stuff that you guys can do without even, like I said, coming to the commission, coming to staff. You could just go ahead and do that. And then. So just once again, emphasizing that all exterior items must be reviewed and approved by the commission at some level before it's undertaken. Um, noting that ACC approval is provided at an administrative staff level or sound like a broken record, um, or by the commission at a monthly meeting depending upon the nature of the work. So we're gonna get into general, just a rule of thumb items that staff can review work work items that staff can review. Once again, that's this list is included in that handout that I have. Um, but it's gutter, downspouts, and really, I get into the rule of thumb, so I don't think we need to get into each individual item. But just a general rule of thumb is any repair or in-kind replacement 
um, that's done within the HCC guidelines that matches the historic design and quality and doesn't result in the removal of historic, historically significant elements can be approved, reviewed and approved by at a staff level. So the flip side of that rule of thumb is the reason why you're going to the commission is because you're asking for something that generally is not matching the, the character of the thing that you want to replace. So if you have wood windows and you want to go to vinyl windows, that's something that the commission can look at because that is an item that the community has noted time and time again is an item that doesn't generally meet the standards of the high quality of material that we find in our local historic districts. Um, so just saying once again that like the rule of thumb, any exterior work that result that will result in a change of materials, the removal of historic elements or new additions to districts go to the commission. Um, and so this is the very last part and I'll run through this really quickly, but this is the actual getting into the actual process. So typically it's an application to the building department that's brought to staff, staff reviews it um, reviews the scope of the work and we determine whether or not it's a scope that meets um, the commission standards for a staff review. So if it's a staff review, we issue the certificate of, of appropriateness, then you would take that letter of approval along with your scope of work to the building department and pull your permit. Um, however, if staff looks at the scope of work and determines that it's meeting that cr criteria for work that the commission has to review, um, we would take that, we would actually work with the homeowner, work with the property owner to talk about what the commission is going to require in order to put together an application for them to review. Um, we schedule a time for um, the applicant at one of our monthly meetings for the commission hearing. So at that wonderful day, when you come in front of the commission, um, the commission hears your presentation. Um, the homeowner or the property owner is, is able to come to the meeting to speak on their case. If the commission approves it, um, a certificate of appropriateness is issued by staff on behalf of the commission. And then, of course, you take that letter with your permit application to the building department and pull the permit. However, if, if the commission denies, there is a um, process um, through which you could appeal the commission's denial, and that's through the State Historic Preservation Office. Or there's always a process of working with staff to see how you can modify your proposal so that you can get it to a point that the commission can review and approve it. So just a few parting tips. Um, so the commission's review starts with the submittal of a complete application to staff. And this tip really comes from the fact that I and my colleague Audra, we do a lot of front end work um, to ensure that the applicant has the right amount of information for us to actually start the review process. Oftentimes I know that can be a lot, a lot of, that can kind of add to a lot of frustration because it is a lot of us kind of having to interact with the property owner versus the property owner being able to um, be empowered to pull their application together. Um, we are working on a process by which we could, oh, sorry, provide more information on our website. Uh-oh. So, oh, here we go. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, we're working on a process so that we can provide better, like, guidance and information to homeowners on our website so that we can empower the homeowners to really understand the process and make it a little less opaque so that there's less frustration on the front end. But really, we, our review doesn't officially start until we receive, oh, I don't know what happened here. Oh. Until we receive that complete application. Um, also noting that staff, that the website and staff are available to answer questions regarding the submittal requirements so that we can get you to that point to where it's complete and we can start the official review. And the sooner an application is submitted, a complete application, the quicker staff can pull the project around. Um, also noting, finally, that we receive walk-in applications Tuesdays and Thursdays between 9 and 4. Um, and staff and administrative approvals can be issued that day if the application is complete. 
And finally, applications can also be submitted to staff via email, and then staff can actually review those applications and then send you your letter of approval over email so you don't have to come in and pay for parking and go through the headache of, of having to come downtown. Um, so I've got my colleague James Foster here once again from the billing department, and I thought we would quickly touch on Final, like, kind of wrap this up with violations. Um, <laughs> um, so violations are defined as exterior work in historic districts that are completed without approval. Yeah, we all know, I, I think we all in this audience are, are familiar with the many violations that happen within our historic district. I just wanted to note that the building department enforces the ordinance via the issuance of fines, tickets, and my favorite, the summons to 36th District Court. So they are, the, the building department through the ordinance has the legal authority to be that hammer and crack down and enforce when it comes to violations within the districts. Um, we, I and my colleague Audra Dye, we are the kind of the gatekeeper in terms of folks reporting violations to us. We always pass them over to the building department and the, although the process is long for the very worst scoff laws, our, I feel that our rate tends to be fairly good um, once a ticket's issued or a notice is issued that folks typically come in, um, especially once they get that summons to 36th District Court and wanna deal with the issue. Um, but of course there are those people that are just scoff laws and, and nothing seems to shake them into coming into the, um, to our offices. Um, further permits, another tool that we have available is um, the ability to not issue any permits on a property until a violation is corrected. So with some intractable scoff laws, they feel like, okay, we can just go ahead and ignore this violation, but then, oh, I wanna get my roof done. Well, we don't issue a permit unless the prior outstanding violation is addressed first. Um, also, a note violations remain with the property until corrected. So although a homeowner or a property owner may leave, that, that violation stays with the address. It doesn't stay with the person. Um, the commission could order those in violation to restore or replicate the resource um, that's altered um, or essentially repair or address the alteration or sorry, the, the violation. Um, and that is under our ordinance, they have that authority to, to do so. And then finally, um, the commission can attach a violation order to a property's deed. But in my mind, um, the purpose or the desired outcome of enforcement is repair or replacement of the building's historic character. So ideally, well, we're not in this business to make money, to drag people to court, in my mind, the ultimate goal of <laughs> enforcement is to bring that building back to the historic character so that at the end of the day, the neighboring houses aren't brought down by work that's not in character, uh, with, uh, in character with the neighborhood. When in doubt, contact HCC staff before you begin your project. Um, so you have my information, um, Jennifer Ross once again. My number is 313-224-8907, and my email address is rossj at detroitmi.gov, and my colleague, Audra Dye, her number is 313-224-6543, and her email address is dye, A, so it's D-Y-E-A, at detroitmi.gov. Thank you. Hello again. Again, my name is Kimani Jeffrey. I'm with the City Planning Commission under the Legislative Policy Division and City Council for the City of Detroit. Um, just wanted to acknowledge our director for the City Planning Commission, Mr. Marcel Todd. If you could raise your hand. And we thank uh, uh, Mr. Kehoe and also Council President for letting us have this opportunity here. Um, 
Real quick, I'm not going to be very long, but I just wanted to share some information about who this, the uh, City Planning Commission is. The City Planning Commission is a nine-member board um, that's advisory to the City Council on issues regarding land use and land use policy. Um, they are a, a state-appointed board that get, derives their statutory powers from the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. So they are state appointed, um, but they are advisory to the city council, like I said, on all issues um, regarding land use policy in the city of Detroit. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out is that CPC, that's an acronym for the City Planning Commission, is uh, the steward of the zoning ordinance. So anything zoning ordinance related, we are the, the authors of that, um, and we typically go through a robust process where we um, uh, deal, you know, we come out to the community, uh, we talk to stakeholders in crafting that zoning, those zoning regulations. M many times people um, sort of either misinterpret or may not understand the difference between our office, which is the CPC, and the Planning and Development Department. So just to give some clarity, the Planning and Development Department is a department that's under the mayor and they report to the mayor, and they are essentially the stewards <coughs> of the city's master plan. We, again, are the stewards of the city's zoning ordinance. And so in master planning, the just uh, so, sort of like the efforts that are going on citywide with the planning efforts, the planning and development department leads those, um, and the master plan informs, it's the broader um, vision or des designations around the city of what the vision is for the city 50 years out, 20, 30, 50 years out. And zoning regulations are the specific, um, the specific regs that uh, basically supplement what that master plan calls for. So that's just a brief um, overview of the difference between our office and the planning and development department. Um, Another thing that I wanted to point out, many times, some of the issues that we see, um, you know, when people come to our office is that many times, I don't think it, it may not apply to people within this room because many of you are here on behalf of residential properties, but many times um, for commercial properties and things of that nature, we get people that come to our office that may have bought a property, may have been informed by maybe a real estate agent, and that information is not always correct. Sometimes people may not have done any research at all, but it's very essential that you find out the zoning of your property before you go and make a business plan or, or make plans for that property. Because the zoning is basically what allows or, or tells you what's allowable for the property that you have. So before you go, uh, I've seen, we've seen it many, many times where people go and invest large, absorbent amounts of money and come and find out that what they plan to do is actually not allowable. So the way that we, we um, when somebody comes to our office, we go and we look at the master plan and we go and look at what the zoning allows for that parcel. And from looking at the combination of those things as well as other factors, we are able to tell you what is allowable for that particular parcel. If people want a rezoning, if, if the, the land that you have, you're requesting to rezone it to allow for something else, we, what the first thing that we do is we refer to what the master plan says, the vision that was set forth, and that is one of the key factors and what allows us to know um, what the, you know if that parcel is able to be rezoned. So that applies to any dist any any parcel in the city of Detroit, as well as historic districts. So that's something that um, is essential for everybody in here to know. And then just uh, just wanted to show briefly a project that we're working on right now. <coughs> um, it's called the. This is a project, and I just want to show how zoning can intersect with historic districts. So right now. There's an effort in the Brush Park Historic District. Um, and essentially what's happening is there's a new type of zoning um, that's called form-based code or form-based zoning. <clears throat> and this is being rolled out um, and, and studied in the city of Detroit for the first time. It's something that's in many municipalities um, around Michigan and also around the United States and even the world. <clears throat> but 
just to give you a, a brief overview of what this means, right now Detroit is governed by what we call use-based zoning, meaning you have a use or, or land is divided or separated by the type of uses. So you, essentially or generally you will have residential uses, you have commercial uses, which you'll see on many corridors. You'll have industrial uses, which are typically separated into certain, certain areas. And then you also have other types of uses, such as special district um, areas. But essentially, that's what use-based zoning is. Um, in the 1940s, that's when zoning, or the first zoning ordinance was adopted in the city of Detroit. And the reason is because um, people found started to realize the health impacts of many of the, the you know, of the way we were living. You know, many times residential was located directly next to industrial uses. That was for ease of use for people to get to work quicker and easier. Um, but then we started to find out that there were many impacts associated with those types of things. So that's when we came to use-based zoning when uh, uses were separated. So now industrial, many times is located far away from residential and commercial, et cetera. So that's what we typically have in Detroit today. Um, another type of zoning we call is, that's called negotiated zoning, which uh, is kind of summed up in our planned development zoning district, meaning this is something that's an innovative use. Um, it may not, <coughs> may not be allowable through any of the zoning districts that currently exist in our zoning ordinance. So what happens is, somebody can propose to rezone to a PD or planned development zoning district and that gives them flexibility in what they can propose. And so they bring a proposal to the city, the city also works with the community and there's a negotiation to come to an agreement on what will protect the health, welfare and safety of the community but also allow something that's innovative that goes beyond what the current zoning districts currently allow. What we're trying to incorporate into the city now is something called form-based zoning or form-based coding. And essentially what that is, is going a step beyond use-based zoning. Uh, right now there's a, uh, a big effort around the nation. Many times you'll hear something called mixed use zoning. Mixed use zoning is basically a effort to bring a mix of uses back together. So how everything was separated to commercial and residential uses, now we're finding out to create more livable communities, more walkable communities. There are many uses that didn't necessarily have to be separated. While we do have to get, you know, separate some of those industrial uses and some of those more intensive commercial uses, there are many that can be come back together. So form-based zoning is what we're essentially doing in Brush Park, um, and it's basically to foster a more predictable result of what the end outcome will look like once a neighborhood is built up. We can go to the next slide. I'll just have a couple of more slides. This just embodies what that looks like, so you're just dictating what the form is. So essentially in this first column you can see that is showing the, the, the shell of what that building would look like, the massing, the scale, and then an architect or a development team could have the liberty to express it in a different architectural expression as they may want to, but the, the, the form of that building will already be set, and so it will be visually represented in a zoning code, so the actual pages in the zoning ordinance will have visual represent, representations so that no, you no longer necessarily need a, an attorney for the community or for a developer to understand, but now you can see what's expected of a developer. And I think this is the last slide. Um, just a quick update. The city um, will be going through a comprehensive zoning rewrite. So our entire zoning ordinance will be looked at to bring it up to current day uh, standards and best practices. So the city council allocated our office uh, monies to be able to um, uh, hire a consultant to look at our zoning ordinance along with our staffs and we'll be in the coming next two years, we'll be looking at that and, and finding what, um, what areas that our zoning ordinance needs to be updated in. And one of those things that we'll be looking at citywide is what areas may be appropriate for form-based zoning. So that's just a quick synopsis of some of the things that's going on uh, regarding zoning and historic districts. And that's all I have.
to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, you can put your hands together for your Detroit City Council President, Brenda Jones. Thank you and good evening to everyone. I, I'm going to be just a quick hot minute. I just wanted to thank you all for being here. This meeting resulted from me going to a meeting with um, Eric and several other people talking about the historic um, houses and homes in the Detroit area and some of the concerns that they had. I, for one, can tell you I learned a lot at that meeting. And as a result of that, I thought it would be good to have meetings across the city to talk about some of the concerns and to share the information with everyone. All too often, we assume that everybody knows everything. And that's not a fact. And so it's always good to learn and to share information with each other. So that's how we ended up here. I'm glad we're here. I'm glad you are here. My schedule has been a little crazy today, and I've been running all day, and I'm going to run out and give the mic back to them so that you can continue on with the meeting. But I did want to come and tell you thank you for coming. Thank you for caring about your community about your neighborhood, and if everybody cared about their community and their neighborhood, what would this city be like? So I thank you all for caring enough to be here on this gorgeous day and for caring. And I will gonna pass the mic on as I walk out the door and if, know that if there's anything that I can do to be of any assistance, I will continue to do just that. And if we need to have more meetings, we're going to do whatever it takes. They said we didn't have enough money in the budget. And then they said, well, let's wait until the next year's budget to do it. I said, you have not because you asked not. Let's do it now and see what we can get. And so we started off. <laughs> we started off with just a little portion there. And I'm looking forward to adding more money for the historic areas so that you can have what you need and that everyone can get educated on what they need to get educated on. So again, thank you for giving me this opportunity and continue on and I think you guys were supposed to end at eight. I don't know if that's gonna happen. So I think you all need to be considered and ask them, do they mind the state? Thank you, Council President. Again, Council President Brenda Jones. Eric, I'm going to, and I'll be moving around with this mic. If you can go and just use your mic for question. We're going to try to rotate to each, um, either side of the room so that everybody question and, um, can, and concerns can be addressed. We want to maybe start on which side, can show show of hands, first person wants to speak. Yes, I'm going to bring, yes. I'm going to bring her up here, if that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Kimley Naylor. I'm a licensed builder, so oftentimes I'm called upon to do some restoration and renovation for properties. And one of the challenges, I'm glad you're having this meeting, first of all, because many of my clients are really challenged trying to get information when we bring the question of, when was your home built? And you need to confirm that information. They don't know where to go. So I think uh, this meeting was timely because, uh, unfortunately, I got here late because I was on a job site. But if we can um, just make that more prevalently available, maybe when they're buying from the land bank, is there a way to make sure that these people get that information? I have a customer who's working on a 1912 home. I know just about a birthing of, I mean, that date of build, she should be considering some things before she go in there and start altering. Because this basement doesn't even have a, a cinder block foundation. It's truly original limestone with different shapes. So you have customers like this. How do we help them as a builder? Side voice. My name again is Janice Chapman. I'm with the City's Historic Designation Advisory Board. If they have a question about dating a home in a locally designated district, they can reach me. My number is 313-224-3487. Again, Janice Chapman, 
313-224-3487. My email address is Chapman, C-H-A-P-M-A-N, J at Detroit, M-I dot gov. Thank you. You're welcome. Second question, then I'll sit down. I've uh, inquired about a property was a former bank and it sits on uh, Grassroot Avenue. Um, in 2015, they had to wait to find title. They found title, they had the right to market it. Now it went back into oblivion and then there was this big sign it's gonna be demoed. So I asked how do I get it off the demo list? I've been trying to buy it for a couple of years. Um, it is a historic property. What is my process because I've been trying to buy it for two years, and then they're offering it to me at some uncrazy price. I mean, like, you're going to tear it down, and you want over 30 grand now? 35 grand for something you going to tear down yesterday. Okay. Um, Who should I talk to? So the person to talk to, if it's a commercial building, it would be the Detroit Building Authority, if it's a city-owned resource? It is a city-owned property, and it's commercial because it's on Gratiot Ave. I would ask if I can get, I'm trying to figure out a way to get, um, your contact details so I could reach out to the DBA and connect you to the person to talk to. Um, Ms. Wesley, maybe, uh, Ms. Wesley. Oh, oh she's up. Okay. Maybe if we can meet up maybe after Yeah, the, we can meet yeah. up, yeah, and I can grab your details and I can hook you up with who you need to speak with. If there's other questions, you can go ahead and feel free to line up at the, I'm in, uh, name is Jeanette, and I'm in uh, Arden Park, East Boston. And I had a question, this is a very old question. Many years ago, we attempted to do some solar on the back. Mm -hmm. And now that they have uh, solar panels that look just like roofing, mm -hmm. it looks no different than my roofing. What, what, uh, what guidelines, what do you have? You know. Uh so I can I could speak to that as well. Um, so the commission is required by our ordinance to review any proposal according to what's called the National uh, Park Service guidelines. So the National Park Service, the guidelines that the commission does use, has an online technical brief, which specifically outlines how those installations can be done in a manner that they can approve. Um, now, the interesting kind of wrinkle on that discussion is those guidelines refer to solar panels. So the big silvery kind of ugly, right. Um, so those guidelines didn't, or they were published before we have, before the kind of advent of these really cool solar shingles. Um, so I have a few of my commissioners here in the audience right now, but that's um, looking at the solar panel and my colleague and I were actually talking about this yesterday. How can we work with our commissioners to start exploring how we could more widely utilize on a house roof solar shingles as compared to the solar panels? Because the solar panels, the installation is really clear. It's gotta be in the back, not visible from the public right of way. The shingles, however, I think we need to look and explore and see if those are, are if we can use those or apply those in a more publicly visible way because they are less obtrusive than the big ugly panels. So that's something that we're looking into right now. Um, so certainly feel free to reach out, contact either me or my colleague, Audra, and we'll talk to you about next steps if, if that's something you wanna look into. All right, any further questions? No. I just have We've got a time comment. for just a couple more questions. My name is Robert Patterson, uh, and uh, uh, I think in the next few months or so, there's going to be somewhat of a uh, uproar, I believe, about the upcoming uh, Detroit uh, water and sewage uh, guidelines for uh, permeable uh, pro pro uh, the amount of permeable land on your property, and I'm just wondering if any uh, planning has been done in this regard as it applies to. Uh, historic uh, areas and whether or not there could be some uh, movement towards things like per permeable concrete and other kinds of uh, landscapings that, that may affect some of these guidelines that deal with exterior properties. Um, so to be honest at this point, no. Um, that's been in the in the purview of DP, or what is it, the Department of yeah, Water, DWSD. Sewer, yeah, DWSD. 
Um, however, we do, the commission does, as I noted during my um, presentation, the, commissioner, the commission has very strict and very precise rules on the type of landscaping that can be installed the type, down to literally the color of the concrete. Mm -hmm. um, the commission is not, or our rules do not ban um, permeable pavers as long as the color and, and it's not mm -hmm. bright white and it's something that's not gonna, at the end of the day, detract from the historic character of the neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So although we're not, we weren't involved with the water department in generating those guidelines, when they come in front of us, any work has to adhere to our guidelines to, like I said, make sure that it doesn't, the work doesn't detract from the neighborhood, so. Okay, well, I just believe it should be something that uh, you should uh, start, uh, start working on uh, and put, putting some effort into the guidelines. Thank you. To your point, sir, our office has been working with the Detroit Water and Sewer Department on the impervious uh, acreage and the whole drainage issue. So we will take that up with the director of DWSD and work in conjunction with our city resources to see what we might be able to do. I can't promise you anything, but we will at least uh, advance your concern to those entities. And if yes, I sir. could simply add, we have over the last few years, um, this is something you're very absolutely, you're absolutely right. This is coming before every municipality in the in the country, and so we have we're we're very close to a stormwater ordinance, which will have stormwater guidelines, which will uh, address or uh, allow you to understand for how you can capture credits for your drainage charges, and or bioswales or rain gardens or whatever it is you think you might want to propose on your property. As Jennifer stated, it would need to be uh, compliant with the zoning district or the historic district. However, we did take those into consideration. And again, the ordinance will be in effect later this summer. And we're currently reviewing the design manuals as we speak. So it is something we're very cognizant of. And you'll have something before us, before you pretty soon. And it'll be on our website. Great, thank so I think you. we have a lot of time for two more questions, and then we'll be around afterwards uh, to if you want to talk with any of us individually. So, thank you. My name is Pam Weinstein. I'm from Rosedale Park, which I think one of the charts listed Dr. Chapman's charts listed us as the largest uh, single historic district. And I think you also said there are ten thousand designated properties. Is that the number? That, yeah. Okay, 5,000. All right. So this packet is fantastic. This is wonderful. This is comprehensive. The thing that says what you need to know about local historic districts, that was one of the handouts that we all received. All right, call me a crazy lady. You wouldn't be the first. I would really love to see this packet mailed out every year, January 1st of every year, to every homeowner in a historic district. If you give people information, guess what? <laughs> You'll have way more compliance. It's not good enough to put things on the website. People need a hard copy in front of them. This has the schedule of all the meeting dates, all the hours, all the con It's It's just perfect because that's my biggest challenge is that as a neighborhood association president it falls on me to tell my residents about all this and that's just patently unfair <laughs> i'm not the drafter or the enforcer of these ordinances the city of detroit is and it seems to me the city should allocate resources to make annual mailings to every property owner to notify them of what their responsibilities are as the owner of a historic property. I'll, I'll get off my soapbox now. Can I just very briefly, and, I, and you're Thank absolutely you, correct. Um, I think that's in part why these town hall meetings came, up, came about. I think Eric, when I was invited out to North Rosedale for that meeting, that was a concern. 
We do send out one, you know, when we designate, you get the congratulations, you are now in a historic district, and we're turning you over to the HDC. That is not enough, and we've come to realize that as more and more uh, resources and properties are becoming his designated as, as locally designated districts. It is about funding. You're talking a, a, a mailing that is going, you know, it's, it's going to be fairly costly. So I know that Jennifer from HDC and myself, we are working with our prospective um, directors, Marcel Todd, who is here with um, the Planning Commission, um, HDAB, and Mr. Cox, and um, to uh, to address that. I know that both the commissioners and our advisory board um, are also have also spoke to this. So that is something that we're looking, and hopefully we'll get out. Um, hopefully by the end of the year. I'm not going to make any, you know, say, oh, it's going to happen in three weeks, because it, it just won't happen in three weeks. But you're absolutely correct, and we are aware of it. Thank you, ma'am. You have the final question, and, and, and then we're going to wrap up. <laughs> Real quick. Um, you generated it, Jennifer, when you had said that the sidewalks are, or sidewalks are very significant, the color. It came up in our association in Sherwood Forest, that uh, we are getting new lines, gas lines putting in, the sidewalks are getting torn up. And the new sidewalks coming in are not historical at all. They're that horrible white, mm. uh, bright, not only white, but bright white. Are they luminescent? Don't they don't glow in the dark? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Are, is anyone supervising our DT or the gas people? I mean, who's supervising them? We might have to take them to 36. Can we? Yeah. Yay! Thank you. 36 district court. Um, I, I, I'll just note that, so that's DPW um, that permits for any work done within the public right of way. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, at the end of the day, you know, not to, once again, as Ms. Weinstein said, put it on the neighbors or put it on the residents, but we really do depend on the residents to let us know when they see stuff like that happening so that we can reach out to our colleagues um, within the other departments. But DPW, they're very responsive. I just need to know that that's happening, and I will now follow up with them on the situation. Not good. <laughs> well, the NDTs, yes. OK, yeah, and definitely just please, if, if you see any of that happening, if you see the trucks out, let us know, and we're able to follow up with the like I said, with the proper department to stop that. Thank you. You got my number. Thank you, everyone. So we'd like to be respectful of your time. We did say we were going to end at 8. But if you could just give me a couple of moments to run credits. I would like to thank Eric Kehoe, our um, Preservation Detroit Town Hall partner. I'm sure you can give him a round of applause. Preservation Detroit, uh, advocacy for historic designation. Dr. Janice Chapman, uh, historic designation advisory board. She talked to us about the, the structure and the governance of uh, historic designation. Jennifer Ross, the historic uh, district committee, commission. Jennifer talked about permitting, tax credits, uh, how you get approved, do's and don'ts. Uh, Jennifer Reinhardt from the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. Yes. Talked about education, resources, advocacy, assistance. And you're going to have to tell us how we can, for those of us who would like to be involved in your um, hands-on training, how can we, training that leads to employment, how can we get involved? Yes. You'll have to tell us about that. Uh, Kimani Jeffrey, my, uh, my colleague on CPC talked about the zoning process and how important it is and how it impacts historic designation. Uh, James Foster of BC <laughs> talked to us about permitting and the inspection process. Of course, we did acknowledge our uh, director of CPC, Marcel Todd. <laughs> and I've also got to thank the participating vendors and contractors who were in the back. Thanks so much to our media services team who follow us around the city to capture the historic events that are occurring and rebroadcast them on TV. Also want to thank from Council President Brenda Jones staff, Linda Wesley Yay. and Yolanda Lockett. 
I have to thank the staff of the Northwest Activity Center for giving us this beautiful room to meet in. And then last but not least, I have to thank you, our studio audience, for making this event a very big success. Thank you so much. My name is Stephen Grady. I'm Chief of Staff for your Detroit City Council President, Brenda Jones. And this will complete our meeting. <laughs>